It's for the sake of the kingdom. But actually the blueprint is men and women stepping up alongside one another fully into who God has made them to be, fully into what they've called been called to be. I'm a mum to five children and I'm also a leader. And the two can coexist. I know I'm called to do both. And by the grace of God, he's he's enabled that to happen. Well, Rach, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Gosh, what a pleasure. A pleasure to be here. I'd love to know a little bit about your world, your family, where you live, the church you're part of. So just give us a little window into life through your eyes. Yeah, I, I, I usually say that I... I juggle like several plates. I'm a good juggler. I'm actually a terrible actual juggler. Um, I'm very uncoordinated in that sense. But in terms of life, I'm pretty good at juggling. So um, there are some there are some major plates that spin in my life. Number one would be my family. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man called Tim, who uh, is a church pastor, a worship leader, songwriter, and uh, we we lead a church together, which we planted coming up to nine ten years ago. Wow. Um, uh, and so we have five children together, um, four biological children and one by adoption. So we have teenagers and a toddler in our home. No. And, um, I, I'm telling you, like, there is nothing more that would sort of really test your character than parenting teenagers and toddlers simultaneously. I can tell you that now. Uh, there are quite 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 a lot of overlap actually between teens and toddlers. So um, <laughs> that's that's a, a huge part of my life is loving and parenting our children. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, our our church, um, Gas Street Church in Birmingham, not Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham, UK. Uh, and so we do that together. And and then I also um, run a, a ministry for women uh, alongside my sister Amy called the Orchard. Uh, which is a, a national ministry that serves um, women in our country and beyond. Uh, it, we we essentially create spaces. We we run a conference. We do a podcast. Uh, we run run a, a church leaders retreat. Essentially, creating spaces where women are empowered and uh, liberated and really hopefully inspired to run, run this race to fulfill their calling and to step more wholeheartedly into their identity in Christ. So they're probably three of the the big plates that I'm spinning right now. One thing I've noticed about the ministry that kind of flows from you and Tim's life is there's like a local expression deeply planted in a local church. And then there's a sense of like giving it away more broadly. How have you personally made sense of that sort of um, very integrated, but like those are kind of two different sort of worlds to live in, like deeply local, but then uh, in your case, nationally or global, like building resources that champion the broader church. How have you made sense of that, even in your own sense of calling? I think I wouldn't have it any other way is the first thing I would say. And yet at the same time, there is a constant temptation to make life more simple and just kind of do one over the other. Like, do you know what? Let's just, let's just forget the local church. Let's be itinerant ministers and just travel around the place and, um, and spend our time doing that. That sounds amazing. And then at other times it's like, oh, this, this kind of, you know, the travel, the, the extra stretch on our lives to, minister beyond the walls of our local church it's just like so much it's too much it's you know let's just let's just say no to everything let's just focus solely on the local church and but we just know that's not right either that god has put both on tim and i this this mandate this to to serve the local church and and the wider church and in a sense it's all i've ever known because when tim and i got married that's what he's always done god raised Tim up as a worship leader and a songwriter at a very young age. He wrote Here I Am to Worship when he was 19 mm. um, as just um, an overflow of his own devotion to Jesus. And then suddenly the song just catches light and is sung all over the world. And out of that flowed this ministry to go beyond the local church. And so for Tim, and, and he was part of a ministry that was very much sort of national, global. So it's all he's ever known. And therefore, 
when I stepped into leadership alongside him, um, FYI, I never wanted to work for the church. I never wanted to be a church pastor. I I wanted I wanted to work in television. That's what I did. I worked for the BBC in London for when we were first married, but it became very clear early on that we were supposed to minister together in a mm-hmm. church context. And praise God, I've never looked back. It's it's that was the best decision. So in a sense, it's all we've ever known. Um, but it doesn't, it's not free of its sort of uh, regular frustrations, but we hold it in tension. And, and ultimately we recognize that there are, they, they're a blessing to one another, that dual call, because you, I think when you're ministering beyond the local church, you have a credibility when you can say, I know what it's like to show mm-hmm. up and pastor week in, week out, all the hassles, all the stress, you know, all the challenges, all the joys. Uh, it, I think it really, it really does give you credibility when you're ministering beyond the walls of the local church. And then it's, it's also so grounding um, to have a base, to have a home, to have a family, to have a community, all the, the beauty and the joy that comes with journeying with people week in, week out. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. I've just found like for, I had a, a small stint where I was doing a lot of work with Alpha and I was in a local church, but I wasn't in the day-to-day work. And I found myself only looking back, I could see like kind of oversimplifying what discipleship looks like, oversimplifying. So, I, you know, teach youth pastors, like just do this and then this and this, and then look what will happen. And now I'm in my, I'm leading the church with my friends and I'm like, it's both way less, like, it's just such a messy journey. Like, it's like two steps oh, yes. forward, one step back, three steps to the right, a circle. Like, it's just everyone's discipleship journey and walk with you is so unique. But it's way more beautiful, actually. Like, when you see how God works in the messiness to bring about deep change in a place. So, I just found, like, that grounding in a local context changes the way I fundamentally preach. Like, I'm more filled with faith about how the kingdom of God grows and less formulaic about how we jump into it. You know what I mean? I do. And I think it's very easy to be black and white when you're not rooted in a local context because it's it, it's easy to sort of have these, you know, ideological ideas that are a, a very, yeah, I guess, binary in a sense. And then when you're in the day-to-day of people's lives, you realize, of of course, truth is truth, but life is messy and Mm. complicated and loving people and journeying with people. It's, 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 it's complex at times. Uh, And I think it, 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 it makes you more able therefore to, um, to ground perhaps what you're teaching in a, in a national global context, um, yeah, in, in real life, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear a bit about the journey of planting gastric. I'd love to know when you guys started sort of like, I can imagine as a couple, like, are we supposed to church plant? Like, what does that look like? I'm curious how long before that happened, those kind of conversations were growing and then how you found yourself led to actually take that jump, move your family and establish a church. I would say one of the keys for us is that we were part of this church, HTB, which you know well, led by Nikki Gumbel, who founded the Alpha Course. And we we were fortunate to be in a church context that was passionate about church planting. And, you know, chatting to other, other people who have planted, not everybody's story is like ours, where we were championed by our sending church. Not only were we championed, we were also sent with a financial gift with the gift of people. Whereas I know others who have planted and it's, it's, it's been a point of contention of difficulty of like, you know, almost um, disloyalty. And so for us, church planting was just sort of established in the DNA of, of, of the church that we were ministering in HTV. And, and Nikki is, he's, he's such a generous leader. You know, he, he's so kingdom minded You know, it was never about building this big empire. It was always about building the kingdom. Like, let's, let's, you know, let's send 
are best off to plant more churches. And so there was never a sense of um, feeling like we were being disloyal to our church. If anything, it was like an extension of the ministry of the church that we were in. And so we we kind of knew fairly early on that one day we would lead our own church. Tim has known that for a very long time. I was mm-hmm. a little slower, slower to catch up, like I said. Um, and uh, But we didn't know where. We were in London at the time. We loved London. London is this, it's an iconic city. It's a pretty fun place to live. It's challenging, but it's London. You know, we felt really cool to London. And we thought we would plant in London. London's a big city. There's room for lots of churches. And we thought we'd, we'd stay there. And then one day, um, Nikki says, look, the Bishop of Birmingham has contacted me and they're really keen to plant a city center church um, that's going to reach out to students, young people, young families. Are you interested? And if you're not British listening to this, you will know that there is a big difference between London and Birmingham. I don't know what the Canadian equivalent might be, but Birmingham is not London. You know, Birmingham, I'm now, I should now be on the tourist board for Birmingham because I'm like, (laughs) don't you dare say anything rude about Birmingham because you're going to hear from me. I love Birmingham, but it's, it's, it's definitely um, edgier. Let's just say Uh, it's more industrial. It doesn't have the sort of the iconic architecture, whatever. But so to begin with, honestly, we were like, no, we do not want to move to Birmingham. Thank you very much. We're called to London. But because we're good disciples, we thought we need to push the store. We need to really discern this. So we we came up to Birmingham for a day. We walked around the city. And honestly, the spirit just moved in our hearts at that Mm. point. It was a miserable day, let me tell you. Like it was January, it was cold, it was raining. The city was not showing off, like humanly speaking. But the Lord just spoke to us. We just knew we were meant to go. And interestingly, Mm. we then, I remember before we moved up to Birmingham, we went on this extended trip to Australia. We had this sort of break. Um, We took the family to Australia. I have family there. And I remember I'd gone for this run on the beach in Sydney, Sydney, is like stunning. I've been to Vancouver. Vancouver is also beautiful. And I was stood on this beach at like dawn in Sydney thinking, Lord, this would be an amazing place to plant a church. How about we come to Sydney? Like surely Sydney is crying out for a church, like, you know, for, led by us. I mean, how humble of us, uh, how humble of me. And I really felt God say, but I've called you to Birmingham. Mm. Why would you want to be anywhere where I've not called you? Mm. And I, I just knew in that moment that the only place I wanted to be was where God had called us to. And, and I, it just really confirmed this call. And so um, we felt before we even arrived in Birmingham, we were meant to be there. We were part of what God was doing. We sensed God was on the move. There was a, a sense of momentum in the city. Uh, there was a sense of us being able to contribute to God, what, what God was already doing in the city. And so, yeah, we, we made the decision fairly quickly and relocated. And I think 25 people said, yeah, we'll come with you. And, and that's how it began. Wow. One thing that I admire about Gas Street is that quickly you became a church planting church, like ascending church. Um, which is beautiful. I was in the DNA of your sending church and you guys lived into that. Tell me a bit about that journey. Even some of the first churches you've sent and what the st- like the ones you've been able to since. And um, cause I think it's really a powerful picture of what's possible when that becomes like, of course we're doing that. Of course we're sending. Um, I guess the only note I would add is I remember being, cause I was working so close to alpha at HTB in the season that you guys were being sent to um Birmingham and you saw like the amount of good team members leave and then new people step up and then I saw that yeah. again and again and again in this like five six year window that was close like it'd feel like some of the most capable staff would be sent but then a new bunch would rise up and that that, that cycle and it just remind it was an up close picture of the cost of being ascending church like what that feels like, but then the faith that grows over time where it's like, 
it's like tithing almost. It's like you give away and it hurts. And then you see God bless and you're like, oh, look what he does. I learned that so much observing it kind of as like an adjacent participant. Uh, and, but it's been really special to watch that live on in the hearts of other plants of HTB. So tell us a bit about your sending journey as a church, sending others. Yeah, I think that's so true. As you said, first of all, it was just wired within us, you know, that, that of course that's what you do. Um, and I think it, it's interesting when we planted the church in Birmingham, I remember our first Sunday, you know, we had, it's like a big celebration. We invited all our friends, the bishop, the bishop of Birmingham came along and he said this phrase that we've, we've, we've never forgotten. In fact, we sort of remind our congregation about this on a regular basis. He said, um, I think this is a church for the uncomfortable. Mm. and. I don't think he was referencing the seats, you know, as it were, but actually the danger with church and there's a, there's a tension here, but the danger with church is that it gets too comfortable. Church Mm. should always be a safe place. So we, we must never confuse creating a safe place, a safe environment with a comfortable environment. And essentially I think the danger is you get so comfortable the, the people get so comfortable every, with, with, with things being exactly as they were the week before. You know, I'm, I sit in the same seat. I hear this, this, the, there's the same structure to the service. There's a rhythm and um, don't mess with it. You know, don't, 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 don't mess with my comfort. And there's something about church planting that's quite disruptive, as you said. You know, you're, you're sending off people often that are brilliant. And you're like, Lord, how on earth are you going to fill the gap? And he always does. He's always faithful to do it. But I also think it keeps you really kingdom minded because the other danger about church, local church is one, people get too comfortable, but then you can also become quite territorial and Mm. quite, um, you become too focused in on your thing and you lose sight of what God might be doing in other parts of the city or in other parts of the country. and, uh, And it can become all about your church your people and there's something about church planting that kind of kills that 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 breaks that it it, it, you know it's it forces you to um to 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 think in in a kingdom-minded way rather than uh building anything that's sort of too much focused around you as the pastor or your ministry uh, and it's been such a blessing to us. We, yeah, we planted, I, I may get the number wrong, I think five or six churches now in nine years. Um, some in Birmingham. Again, that's the other thing. It's like, oh, don't plant too close to what your church, you know, again, don't death threaten your own thing. And actually, I, I, we're in a city like h- hundreds of thousands of people. And most of them don't know Jesus. The minute Mm. we start to feel competitive with other churches, that is a major flag. Mm. I mean, there there is so much need. There is so that the, you know, the harvest is plentiful. In fact, that's what Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful. There's nothing wrong with the harvest, but it's the workers that are few. There's an issue with the workers. Mm. And so Mm. the minute we we feel threatened by a church that moves it, that moves in down the road, like, we need to we need to give ourselves a serious talking to, and again, church planting enables you to die to that temptation. Mm. So, and we've seen so much life. We've just seen, you know, people giving their lives to Jesus, multiple people being baptized, leaders raised up, communities changed through the churches that we plant, and then those churches are now going on to plant their own churches. So it's this beautiful kingdom multiplication. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I love that. Tell me about empowering less experienced leaders. Like part of the the subtext there is giving people reps in ministry and feedback or whatever, the the gift of experience in a safe environment. But then you send them and then it's like, you're likely the next person is less experienced again. And you've had the chance of of doing that a number of times. What, What have you learned along the way of like, what does it feel like? And what kind of practices actually support giving maybe a younger or less experienced leader the opportunity to actually cultivate 
their gifts and their own unique ministry expressions such that they can be sent or step into the fullness of what God has for them. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that is absolutely essential, but also can at times feel (laughs) really difficult, really costly, because, you know, for Tim and I, we like things to be done well. It's There's a tension around wanting to kind of put our best foot forward, as it were, particularly like, say, let's take Let's take the Sunday context, because obviously leadership manifests and expresses itself way beyond a Sunday. But let's just take the Sunday context. You know, you you put somebody up to host a, a gathering or to lead a, a service and they're new and they're inexperienced. And you're sitting, you know, at times it's like it's painful. But I, I would actually credit Tim with this. Tim has always been amazing at releasing and raising up leaders. Mm. And I've really learned that from him, that the the bigger win is perhaps sacrificing excellence, or I wouldn't do it like that myself, in order to see young people released and raised up. And so we, we're constantly encouraging um, new leaders to step into those spaces of leadership, again, thinking of a Sunday. And I think probably the t- the, the, the keys are r- relationship and feedback. You know, when I was first leading, A, there were, were, weren't many other women around. Um, I didn't really have many female mentors. Um, and I would be preaching and leading gatherings and things. And I would get very, very little feedback. And it was extremely difficult. And so Mm. what happened for me is I saw every one of those opportunities as a pass or fail scenario. Mm. So it's like, I'm going to get up, I'm going to preach this message, or I'm going to host this service. And at the end of it, I'm either going to have passed or I'm going to have failed. And if I've passed, it's because they ask me again. And if I failed, it's because they never ask me again, or they don't ask me again for a long time. And I would have loved to have had the safety net, if you like, of those in authority over me at the time saying, Rach, we see a leadership call on your life. We see a teaching gift on your life. We're going to encourage you to get up time after time after time. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get it wrong. But whatever happens, this is not a pass or fail scenario. Mm -hmm. We believe in you. We see something in you. Go and give it a a try. And then I'm going to give you feedback. I'm going to encourage you. And I've tried to do that with some of the women that I have raised up. I've said, almost said exactly that. I created the safety net of, I believe in you. I see something in you. It's not fully developed yet. It, it, it's, it's going to grow over time. I'm going to give you some feedback to encourage you. But I don't want you to feel like when you step into this as a, a newbie, that you're in a pass and fail scenario. And mm. I think that's really important that we do that. And that only happens really out of relationship. And that's that that's hard because it's time consuming. But um, for those that we're raising up, we would try to ensure that there was enough relational connection that uh, they they would just know our love, uh, our love for them as a person beyond mm any gifting that they might, even even in its rawest state, that they might be bringing to the table. Mm. I really appreciate those reflections. It's interesting for me. I, I've been thinking a lot because I, I, I have a really high value on empowerment because it was, that's, I, was, I experienced that um, given lots of opportunities before I had any resume to back it and made a lot of mistakes. Still am. And as we've been trying to live into this idea of being an empowering church, Actually, I remember one time hearing Tim and Pete Gregg speak. I think it was Tim or Tim and Al. They were at Worship Central Conference in Vancouver. And I think Tim said something very simple that we talk about all the time. I think he said something to the effect of like, hey, like we, so they're going to mess up. They're going to do bad worship or the preach. But he's like, maybe just out of one of the three, the host, the worship leader, and the, the preaching, maybe just one can be that empowerment and then get be stronger the other two. And then that way, and it was such a simple piece of advice, but we actually, that's like internal language now for even as we design Sunday services is like, you know, we, 
that we would go, okay, like we actually can afford to like, really, let's just take a risk here or whatever. And it's going to be okay because, you know, Chris is going to preach or Daryl's going to preach. It's going to be fine or whatever. Um, but what I've realized in my own journey is how much of it is actually an internal journey for me. Like there's little idols around how I want Sunday to feel for the guest or for, cause it's like, I got an idol in my heart. I always oh, just representing me or the most interesting one recently is I had to do some work to almost like forgive and love 23 year old Jason in ministry so that I don't react when I see maybe that youthful zeal or arrogance or stuff that is part and parcel with just being young in ministry. And you can't. Yeah. And I realized it was actually less about the person, like what was the internal wrestle and actually more about my own heart. And I've been trying to call through with the Lord, like a real love for, I can't believe I get to create a mm -hmm. space for young ministers to grow. And that Absolutely. is a beautiful age and stage. And, and then, but it's, it's crazy how much of it I had to sort of, and you know, you probably like me have had moments where you were hurt early in ministry by somebody who maybe was well-meaning or maybe not well-meaning. Maybe they liked you for your gifting, but not for who you were. But those little like scars are like bleeding out in my own leadership now. And so like so much of my work to be a loving, empowering leader today is actually dealing with some of the stuff that I experienced in my twenties and going like, yeah, I don't know if you've experienced any of that, like that internal journey what? of like dealing with the stuff so that you can go, I'm comfortable in this space that I don't know what's going to happen and it's all going to be fine. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when Tim and I planted the church, I had been, I had uh, like sort of the seven years prior to that, I had been primarily a stay at home mom. I'd been raising our four biological children and uh, Tim had been exercising this leadership gift since he was like 19, you know, and so naturally he had way more experience than I did. And yet we knew we were called to lead together. And so when we planted the church, I was stepping into leadership with way less experience under my belt. I would also argue, though, that staying at home and raising small children is an incredible training ground for leadership. Um, but and spiritual not, formation. In spiritual formation, yeah, but you're not regularly standing on a stage with a microphone. You know, it's more of the, the heart stuff that's going on. So, but Tim, honestly, I mean, we used to have like these little, I don't want to say fights, but these sort of mini disagreements because he would be sitting on the front row. So I would, I would step up to lead and he'd be sitting on the front way, row and he would have this face on of like sheer panic and stress. <laughs> like she's going to screw up. She's going to, she's going to screw up. She's going to say something wrong. She's going to, and it wasn't, it, what's interesting is it, it wasn't because he was, um, he didn't trust me. It was because he was so anxious on my behalf. Mm. He was so anxious about how I would feel if I messed up, you know, the fallout afterwards, like, uh, and I'm like, Tim, you, you've just got to let that go. Like, just, just trust me and stop scowling at me like from the front row. Could you, and to be honest, there, and even when we would lead together, like side by side, I could feel this, him like tense up, you know, um, and also he had certain ways of doing things. And, uh, and I was like, well, why, why do we have to do it like that? And he said, well, because that's the way to do it. And I'm like, who says, who says what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, actually, yeah, you're right. But maybe we don't have to do it that way. And so th there have been times where I've actually, even though we lead the church together, we've had to find places where we, where for me, to be honest, I've had to lead without him, like whether it's Sunday services or staff meeting or whatever in order to sort of exercise that gift without feeling like he's kind of next to me, you know, stressing out. And he's, he's way more relaxed. But actually, it was helpful for me to be able to say to him, look, it might not just be me that feels that, that's picking that up. You just got to chill out, you know, relax. And I've been really mindful that when I, like, what what we give up, even when, we, when you know, we've got, we're releasing young people to lead, what, what are we what are we projecting mm. in our facial expression and our, you know, are we relaxed? Are they feeling the tension? You know, I think it's really important that we're aware of that because they're picking up every tiny. And again, it's that, it's that thing about power, isn't it? We forget sometimes that because we are the leader, we carry this authority that can be quite intimidating, even if we don't want it to be. And so, Every little gesture, every mm. little word that we do or don't say is going to be read into 
And mm. so we have to be overly mindful and extra, almost do the extra work of, of presenting relaxed. I'm for you. I'm smiling. I'm with you. Those yeah. little, those little um, body language things are so important. I got called out early. I got teased by one of my teammates be like, Jay, you just look so serious on that front row. And it's, it's exactly. honestly like, it's like I'm watching so somebody on a tightrope. I'm watching them yeah. on a tightrope. I'm like, are they going to go down? And it's like, it's just a reminder. It's like, everything's going to be okay. Like, just relax. What's the worst that could happen, really? Like, what's yeah. the worst that could happen? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really helpful. I appreciate you sharing that. I'd love to hear about um, the work you're doing through Orchard uh, across England. It's, it's beautiful. And uh, I know you've recently had some annual gatherings. Just tell us a bit about the heart of the ministry and some of what you've been experiencing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a reluctant women's pastor. I think that's probably the fairest way to describe it, that I, I've enjoyed going to like women's events at church, but I really enjoy mixed spaces. I love the company of men. I've got brothers. I've never been drawn necessarily to those spaces. And yet weirdly, God keeps um, inviting me to lead spaces that are for women. Um, and about five years ago, four or five years ago, I had resisted at that point beginning a women's ministry at Gas Street. Um, because in my mind, if I'm honest, this is a bit of a confession, I always saw women's ministry as a space within a church, particularly a church where women weren't being raised up in, in leadership positions, that the women's ministry is almost this space where women who had a leadership gift had space to exercise it where they weren't able to kind of in in normal church in regular church and i'm like we don't we don't have that problem like gas street is full of amazing female leaders like y- young women being raised up we we got we we got tons of them and so we don't have a problem that we don't need this women's ministry space for them to exercise their gifts they're just doing it in church and god really convicted me about that and I really felt God say, it's time to gather the women. You need to gather the mm. women. And my sister felt the same thing at the same time. And so we started this thing called The Orchard. We put on a gathering and it sold It sold out. We had like 500 tickets or 450 tickets. It sold out like within, I don't know, very short space of time. But like, oh, wow, there's a hunger here. The other surprise is that it wasn't just the women from our churches. My my sister is all, she's a vicar in the Church of England. And so we 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 just knew there was a hunger. And so then we, a year later, we, we hired a bigger venue. Again, it, it sold out like months in advance. And that's just kept happening the last, the last couple of years. And so we keep sort of having to rent bigger buildings. And the sense that we are catching up to is that God is doing something profound and wonderful amongst his women in these days. I can only speak for the UK, but I see it happening in other places. I was just on a Zoom call with some women in the Netherlands. I'm going to speak at a conference there. They're they're sensing the same thing. And it's around empowerment. It's around identity. It's around calling. And I think it would be fair to say that women over the centuries have lived with glass ceilings over them. And I am passionately convinced that biblically there there are no glass ceilings in terms of where a woman uh, might be called to exercise her gifting, be that leadership or anything else. And I think we're seeing some of those lids being lifted. Mm-hmm. I and and it excites me hugely because it's for the sake of the kingdom. I think women also live with certain glass ceilings that exist internally, inadequacy, shame, imposter syndrome, and I'm seeing by the power of the Holy Spirit some of those glass ceilings being smashed. And again, it's not for the sake of equality, you know. Although equality is important because it's 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 the gospel in a sense, 
you know. Uh, it's for the sake of the kingdom that actually the blueprint is men and women stepping up alongside one another fully into who God has made them to be, fully into what they've called, been called to be. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that there are God has created us male and female distinctly, but I think there's way more overlap in our call than has than history has allowed. And I'm a mum to five children, and I'm also a leader. And the two can coexist. Now, it looks different to Tim as a father and a leader, but I'm, I'm passionate about... Now, I'm talking about the context of leadership. Of course, not all women, not all mums are called to church leadership, but I'm for me, I'm, I'm, I'm navigating this road between holding, holding intention of being faithful and stewarding this leadership gift, this, this call to hold this, this, uh, this thing called the orchard and this thing called gastric church at the same time, this deep desire to love and to raise my children really well. And in the day to day, it's, you know, it's, it's messy. It, it, it's, it's not always straightforward. It's, there is, the season is constantly shifting and changing, but I know I'm called to do both. And by the grace of God, he's, he's enabled that to happen. Mm. I feel like um, when I'm praying for my congregation and then I'm picturing the city of Vancouver and longing for the fullness of the kingdom, when I think about individuals feeling like they, there's a story that's been pitched to them, whether it's because of their gender or the family of origin or maybe whatever, we all have these scripts and that they would somehow go, oh, I'm not counted in to be used in a special way by God. I, it, it really grieves my heart because it's like the, the most beautiful thing is a church fully alive the spirit of God fully animating each person to the fullness of a unique calling. And, um, and so I just, I just appreciate your deep passion to invite people in and to write a different script. And, um, and I think your life's an amazing example of that as well, as you're navigating the humanness of it and the trade-offs and tensions, but curiously saying, Holy spirit, like I want to step into the fullness of what you'd have for me. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's costly, isn't it? It's, um, it's uh, obedience is never without cost. And I think, um, sometimes I stand back and think, how on earth am I hit? Like, uh, I mean, I, I was like a rebellious teenager. I, uh, my story of coming to faith in Jesus is, you know, I, I walked away from my faith, like for, a, for a while. And, you know, it was, it was drinking, it was sex, it was the whole lot. And when I came back to faith in Jesus, I knew God loved me. I had this powerful hand with the Holy Spirit. I was filled with the presence of God in the most beautiful way. I just knew God loved me. But I felt really disqualified because mm. of the choices I've made. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm out. You know, I, I know you love me, but, you know, I, I if, if, if 21-year-old Rachel knew what, 46, 46, 47, can't remember. 46 year old Rachel was doing now. I would just have laughed. Mm. You know, it isn't. And I think, I think part of the reason that I'm here now is because I just kept saying yes. Like, mm. it, like, God has given me some natural gifts that I've been able to use. But honestly, I think most of the reason is because I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, and I, I think sometimes we kind of, we overcomplicate obedience and calling. And I think a lot of the time it's the simple, yes, not, not the cheap. Yes. It's costly. You know, like the times when I said yes to preaching, I was rubbish at it. I had no experience, so, so, you know, a pastor saw something and it was really costly because ever, for, for a long time I would get up, I'd preach, I'd get off the stage, I'd feel this like tidal wave of shame. I'd just think I'm never doing that again. I'm Because often I was the only woman for a long time 
and I was definitely not the cleverest in the room. And I just thought, Lord, I, I just can't put myself through that level of shame at the end of it. And then for some reason, somebody would ask me again and I'd be like, okay, I'll do it again. And I think there are lots of women who never say that second yes, because the first time is too costly mm. emotionally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And for me, again, tied in with this vision around the orchard is seeing women keep saying yes, just allowing the spirit to, to break through the shame, to break through that sense of inadequacy, even to break through some of the systems and structures that actually collude with that shame and adequacy and say, no, I'm, Lord, if, you, if, you, if you're opening this door, I'm going to keep saying yes. I'm going to keep saying yes. I'm going to keep saying yes. And um, I, I, I'm pretty convinced that's the only reason that I'm doing some of the things that I'm doing now. That's because he's like, oh, here's someone that's got like a tiny little bit of natural talent, but quite a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to see, I'd love, yeah. I feel excited about seeing more women say yes. Mm. Well, I'm so, so grateful for the gift of your time with us today. It's been lovely to spend this time together and a great gift to hear your story and what God's doing in and through your lives as a family and through you personally. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure.